Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Bemis. I'm the Shine consultant here with Moth Reading. I've been doing it for a number of years. Work with Mystic Valley Elder Services out of Walden. First, the, first the good news, the Red Sox start at 5 o'clock. I yes, promise you'll you do. be done before 5 o'clock. <laughs> 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 um, there are some other, this is the major handout that I'll be going through, but there are some other supplementary handouts over on the counter over here as well that you can, you can help yourselves to. And I think we're on North Reading Cable TV for our future pro late night programming. Huh. Uh, and for that purpose, this, this is Tuesday, October 16, 2018. This is day two of open enrollment. It's actually, it's, it's been, Medicare loves to tweak these things, so it's no longer called Medicare open enrollment, it's called Medicare fall open enrollment. And there is a reason for that, which I'll get into as we get down and go through this. Um, first of all, I just wanted to touch on Shine, what we do, it's the, we call the overview, it's on, on the second uh, part of the uh, exhibits that you have. Shine is serving the health insurance needs of everyone on Medicare. We try to provide free and unbiased insurance information and counseling to Medicare beneficiaries of all ages. And keep in mind that we do have some Medicare beneficiaries who are disabled or partially disabled that we work with who are, you know, well under 65 in some cases. We educate beneficiaries and try to empower them to make informed decisions about their health insurance, about your health insurance, what's coming up for 2019. There are over 700 Shine councils available throughout Massachusetts to help. And beyond that, we're part of a network that's all around the country. So wherever you go, uh, there are councils that are, are available. Uh, a peculiarity in, in Massachusetts and in Florida were called Shine Councilors. Everywhere else is called SHIP Councilors, serving the health insurance needs of people but it's the same uh, national program. And incidentally, I'd have one more piece of good news. If you haven't heard, Social Security cost of living adjustment is out for next year, and it's 2.8%. It's the first significant increase in Social Security benefits in a number of years. So, all right, so now we'll get to uh, open enrollment. We're, as I say, we're in day two of a period that started on October 15 and ends on December 7th. It's the same dates every year. And it's, uh, it, it is one time of the year when everybody who's on Medicare can review, compare, and enroll in Medicare health and drug plans. You may be on a plan or a health and drug plan now. You can do a review and change plans, which uh, if you take action during this open enrollment period, any action you take takes effect on January 1, 2019. I would point out that you're probably getting barraged in the mail, I have been with uh, notices from all kinds of uh, health plan providers trying to get you to sign up. It's not only snail mail, you see it on TV, I get them in the emails all the time. The important thing to remember with all of this is when you get mail from your insurance plan, if, you, if you're in, in, a, in a Medicare plan at this point, do open it up and take a look at it because they're informing you about the procedures uh, for the fall and more importantly about any changes that they may be making in their plan for next year. Many of these plans make at least minor changes from year to year. Most of them tweak at least their uh, drug formularies, so uh, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But the other thing I wanted to point out is that uh, this session can be helpful to anyone not yet on Medicare, but perhaps anticipating enrolling in Medicare in 2019, because the plan information that I refer to here is relevant to you folks as well you'd have a different set of dates to work with in the open enrollment period, but the rest of the information is, uh, hopefully, it should be very helpful. And I was just going to suggest if you have questions, 
Um, why don't I'll be glad to take as many questions for as long as possible at the end. What I found out is that if people start with questions during it, oftentimes it's actually answered as I move along. So let's see what happens and, and start by your questions and we can talk afterwards. <coughs> Again, this is your annual opportunity to review your health and drug plans. It's important because not only are there plan changes out there from year to year, but your health needs may change from year to year. And that's especially true when it comes to prescription drugs. Prescriptions can change from year to year. You may have a different set of uh, prescriptions to some extent that you'll be taking on January 1 in 2019 than whatever you were taking on 2018 on January 1. So by reviewing your plans, costs, and benefits and comparing them with other options available for the upcoming year, you could potentially save money and ensure that you receive the health care benefits and drug coverage you need at the best possible price. And again, I and my associates uh, can uh, help you uh, on a one-on basis compare plans and help you uh, point you toward uh, a good decision that you would end up making. Shine Councilors, again, I'm the Shine Council in North Reading. Reading has one, Wakefield has a couple, Melrose has a couple. We all, all have them. And different councils in different towns have slightly different arrangements and different hours. So I do often, I obviously would see anybody from North Reading who wants to make an appointment here. I do see people from out of town who, for whatever reason, schedule with me as well. And I'm sure it works and vice versa. And the appointments would be governed through the uh, Sherry and Susan uh, here at, and Jean here at the uh, center. They do the bookings for me and I, I try to make as many of the appointments as I can on Tuesday afternoons because this place is pretty quiet on Tuesday afternoons. So I schedule people at 1, 2, and 3 o'clock on Tuesdays. But as we go through open enrollment, I'll start squeezing people in uh, late afternoons. Late afternoons meaning 3 o'clock on a Monday, Wednesday, or a Thursday. And whatever else we have to do so we can see everybody that wants to be seen. So what to do during open enrollment? You want to review your options for what would be coming up next year and decide. We'll talk about that. Decide which option will be best for you next year. You want to compare plan prices, you want to compare coverages, you want to compare benefits. You need to decide whether to stay in your current plan or enroll in a new plan. Most importantly, if you stay in your current plan, there's no further action that you need. Your current plan is going to assume that you're going to continue with them in January unless you tell them otherwise. One of the key players in uh, indirectly in, in helping you decide whether to stay in your current plan or go to a new plan, you probably all have a primary care physician. And keep in mind that not all primary care physicians have all the plans. So you need to, uh, if you're thinking about changing from plan A to plan B, You'd, still, you'd want to verify with your primary care physician that he is, is covering that plan. If you like, if, I'm assuming you'd like to stay with the primary care physician that you now have. And again, you would need to enroll in a new plan by the December 7th deadline. And again, again, uh, appointments with Shine Counselors can be made and we'll try to assist you in that process. I'm looking at ex an exhibit entitled Medicare Supplement Coverage Options. Now, it's a couple of pages in. Um, you know, we'll just talk briefly about that. Most bet Medicare, well, 65%, this is a national figure of Medicare beneficiaries take original Medicare. Original Medicare is Part A and Part B. Part A is your catastrophic hospital insurance coverage. If you have Part A Medicare, you're probably covered for about 80%, give or take, of what a hospital bill might be, that still leaves you with a 20% gap, which at times can be enormous. I've run into people who have, that I've actually consulted with, 
sort of run into some big medical problems the following year or the year after, and it was not unusual where their hospital costs were going up for anywhere from 40,000, 50,000. I had two people whose hospital costs were over $300,000. So the cost can really magnify, and that's why it's important to get some coverage to, uh, to, cover, uh, to cover the difference. Your Part B medical insurance it's basically what you would pick up. You need to have Part B in place in order to get additional Medicare plan coverage. Part B provides uh, coverage support, financial support for various outpatient services, tests, some of the doctors, uh, some of the costs associated with seeing a doctor. And uh, one of the exhibits, in fact, I'll point out that I left them over on the, on the, on the side over here is a, a thing entitled Part B uh, Coverages. And it's a two-sided sheet, and it lists all the coverages that you get either for free or minimal cost by just being in Part B, for all the diagnostic testing that's included on that listing. Part B premium for the last couple of years, you do pay a premium for B. A is, quote, free. It's really not free. You've been paying for it all your life with payroll deductions. But for Part B, the premium for the last couple of years has been $134. In 2019, that basic Part B premium goes up slightly. It does go up to $135.50. So once you uh, have your Part A and B in place, and those of you that are on Medicare have your Part A and Part B at this point, uh, I would presume. You've got to have at least the A and you probably have the B. Is there anyone here that's that's here because they're going to be new to Medicare and to, okay okay so you would not have your Medicare cards as of yet so one of the first things you would have to do would be to apply at the at the appropriate time uh, to get Medicare coverage and uh, and you can do that a month or two before you uh, obtain your if it's if it's your 65th birthday that that's the situation. Keep in mind that whatever day you turn 65 in a month, Medicare coverage begins the first day of that month. So if your birthday is October 25th, your Medicare coverage is, starts on October 1. And you would want to line up your, your uh, coverages that you want to have uh, in a couple of months preceding, although you can do it, do it during the last month in September, in my example. You get everything lined up in September, it will take effect on October 1st. Now once you have your original Medicare in place, Part A and Part B, you then have some decisions to make uh, which way you want to go to get coverage. If you have A and B, that's your original me Medicare. And that includes, again, your hospital benefits and certain medical outpatient benefits under B. You then can go from there, and there's two different directions to go. One is picking up a uh, Medigap insurance plan, which covers some or all the Part A and Part B deductibles and co-pays. It's a complete coverage. I'll talk about that a little bit more, a little bit further in, into the uh, presentation. But if you do pick up that coverage, I will say right now that by law, there is no prescription drug coverage with that. You have to pick up a standalone prescription drug plan to go with it. So that is like if you reach a fork in a road and you're 65 and you get A and B in place, you go this way for the Medigap coverage, your option is to go the other way and pick up a Medicare Advantage plan. And that's uh, very much like a, an HMO, which you may be used to from uh, uh, when you were when you were perhaps working, and that's managed care option of Medicare. It's uh, it's uh, Medicare contracts with private insurance companies to provide these benefits. If you've got a structured HMO or a PPO with, with network coverage that, that uh, you would be in. Well, again, we'll talk a little bit more about these. But this is this is what you do. You would go to a Medigap coverage on the one hand with a standalone prescription drug to go with it. Or 
take a Medicare Advantage plan, which would have the prescription drug feature embedded within it. So here's a little more on the Medicare supplement plans, or Medigap. Original Medicare is still your primary insurer. The Medigap coverages are separate policies. They're sold to back up Medicare. And as it says, they tend to be bought by people with a high utilization of medical services and or who want comprehensive coverage as well as those who would like to be able to choose the doctor which they see without a referral. Medicare supplement plans do not require a primary care physician to manage your, your, your health. You may have a primary care physician still, but when you get the Medicare Medigap plans, the, the uh, network that I referred to before is universal throughout the country. It's wherever Medicare is. So you can pick and choose uh, what doctors you go to, what hospital you go to. If, you, if you're based here but you go to Florida for three months and you get into a situation where you need uh, medical support, hospital visits, rehabilitation services, you can get all that, all that in Florida without coming back to Massachusetts. If it doesn't work that way with the Medicare Advantage plans, so you would have to come back to Massachusetts in order to get follow-up treatment. So Medi Medicare, Medigap is the coverage with the least amount of restrictions. Any provider who takes Medicare will accept your supplement plan anywhere in the United <coughs> States. Now, Again, for the pros for this Medicare, Medigap plan are, you can see any provider that accepts Medicare, no referrals or primary care physician is needed. In Massachusetts, there's continuous open enrollment for Medigap plans, which is a great feature. The one problem with that is if you're in one of those plans and you've got a standalone prescription drug plan to go with it, Guess what? That the standalone prescription drug coverages are subject to open enrollment. So if you're in a Medigap plan, and uh, again, you, if you leave it at any point in time, which you can do, you've still got that standalone prescription drug plan in place. So that's the good part of that. But they, they don't work in synchronization uh, as well as you might like it to be, but it, you know, if you, if you know what the situation is and can plan for it, it's not a problem. You just you have to know that one is a subject to open enrollment rules and the other is not. Many of these plans offer travel coverages. Most importantly, in Massachusetts, there are only two types of Medigap plans that the insurance department will allow. In most states in this country, that you go to, there are what I call iterations of Medigap plans with slight differences. And they run from plan A through plan M, N, O, or P. Massachusetts has said, we're not going to do any of that. We're just going to have one plan. And if any insurer wants to come into Massachusetts and sell a Medigap plan, this one plan, supplement one, is the plan you're going to sell, no other. There's also, <clears throat> excuse me, there's also so a second type of plan, which is the uh, core plan. The first one I just described is supplemental one. <clears throat> second one is core, with uh, almost the same coverage, but there's one distinct disadvantage to the core plan. One advantage, too. The premium for a core plan is about half of the premium for the supplemental one. But in return for that, if you have the misfortune of having to go into a hospital, particularly if it's more than once in a given year, you are responsible for the first $1,380 each time you go into the hospital if you have that core plan. And if they have the supplemental plan, that's covered. And the difference in premium between the core plan and the supplemental one over a 12-month period is 
you can almost fill in the answer for me, about 1,360 mm -hmm. bucks. I think it's the, the number for, okay, it's 1,340, and we don't have a final number for 2019, but it's going to be about that. And again, there's no, uh, no drug coverage with that plan. Now, if you take a look at the Medicare Advantage plans, they're network type plans, either HMOs or PPOs. They're covered through private plans, right, uh, insurers like Blue Cross, Tufts, Fallon, several others, contract with Medicare to provide these, pl these plans to you. And they are the primary insurer. Medicare backs them up. You're going to be in a situation where referrals may very well be needed. There will be various co-pays, various deductibles. Prescription drugs coverage can be included. Medicare Advantage plans tend to attract people who are not high utilizers of medical services who want a lower premium plan. And there are about 50 different Medicare Advantage plans, give or take, on a list. And the monthly premiums for these plans vary greatly. They could be as low as zero premium a month and as high as about 200 a month. And just remember one basic thing. The lower the premium, the higher the deductibles. The higher the premium, the lower the deductibles. So, in a sense, you're going to pay for it one way or another. However, if you're in relatively good health and you take a zero premium plan or a low premium Medicare Advantage plan, you're really not utilizing the services and you're not paying a lot out of pocket. If you stay healthy for that year, you're a winner. For the Medicare Advantage plans, if you're out of network, you, you can expect to have only emergency or urgent care coverage. I'll go back to my Florida example. If you're in Florida and you have an emergency situation, yes, you would go to a hospital and yes, you would get coverage from your Medicare Advantage plan. You would probably have to file some paperwork to affect the coverage, which you wouldn't have to do here, but you would get the coverage. The kicker is if you come out of a hospital in Florida and you need rehabilitation services, you have to come back here to get it in order to be covered. So for people who travel, travel quite a bit, or go to, another, go to Florida for the, for the winter or whatever, uh, that's something to think about. Now there is, uh, that's, the, that's the classic HMO. HMO is a I call it a circular type network. A PPO is a double or even a triple network where you can go from the inner ring to an outer ring and still get most of your coverage just as though you were in an HMO. It's a wider expanded network that's available for you. Now the new, this one, I mentioned right up front that this is now called the fall open enrollment period. They've added the word fall to it. And the reason for that is that there is a new open enrollment period taking effect on January 1, which ends on March 31. And this will allow folks to make a one-time change from one Medicare Advantage plan to another. If they find out during that first quarter it's not working to their best <coughs> advantage, perhaps it's, a, it's the plan formulary, uh, perhaps it's a hospital situation, you can do what you could never do before, and that's opt out of the plan and opt into a new one, Medicare Advantage, during that first quarter. We've always had the right between January 1 and February 15th of opting out of a Medicare Advantage plan, but you could not get back into anything at that point. So that's a significant change and a good change. And of course, if we all do our homework and we do it right, 
you won't have to face that problem, but it's good to know that that's there. Now, there are pros certainly to having a Medicare Advantage plan. It's generally lower cost. It's a convenience of having a bundled plan, only one plan, with both your health benefits and drug benefits included. And there's a potential for better coordination of care through an HMO with your primary care physician as, as the quarterback. The Medicare Advantage plans do offer some additional benefits such as hearing, dental, vision, and annual exams. But I would point out that at least a couple of the uh, Medigap plans also have these uh, benefits. If it's a rider within the plan itself, these hearing, dental, vision, and, a and uh, annual exams, a minimal cost per month, but the, benefit, the benefits, in my opinion, are minimal as well. You get a free screening or whatever. There are, speaking of dental plans in particular, there are some dental plans that you can buy into and uh, get some additional dental coverage. But they get relatively pricey, particularly if you're looking for a dental plan that covers sophisticated work in your mouth, uh, anything beyond, well, anything beyond cleanings and, uh, and checkups and x-rays. Fillings and certainly get into uh, crowns and dental implants. Uh, you have to pay a fairly high price for dental coverage and with the high upper tier plans, you pay for a year, six months in some cases, a year in other cases before the benefits can potentially even be used. They don't want somebody coming in who's going to the dentist the next day that has a dental implant in, 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 uh, in process. But keep in mind, speaking of dental, just my own experience, just before I retired, I had a massive situation uh, Three quarters of my mouth was good, but one quarter was bad, and it meant getting everything out what was left. And I went the dental implant route, which I have never regretted. It's been wonderful. But what happens is, just before I retired, I had the clean out done because that's that's a that's a Part B hospital type benefit, and I was covered with my um, and my my work is planned, so I got that done. Then I went off and did the rest of it out of pocket. So, and again, as it says here, uh, we talked that there are zero premium plans. We'll always check out the max out of pocket costs, and they can vary widely. Hearing and vision are limited, as it says here. And I, I gave you a dental plan example. Some are now offering a hearing aid re reimbursement amount of special cost to a specific <coughs> provider, such as such as true hearing. So there are those more and more of these wrinkles that are being added as we, as, as we go along. Um, getting back to the Medigap plans, I mentioned that there's no prescription drug coverage. You have to do a standalone prescription drug coverage. It's, it's under Part D, Medicare prescription drug coverage. And for 2019, there are 26 plans, 26 carriers offering these standalone plans. There was 22 this past year. Basically, keep in mind that your coverage for Part D is provided by standalone prescription drug plans or the drug plans that are embedded in your Part C or Medicare Advantage plan. Keep in mind how important it is to align yourself with a preferred pharmacy. Pharmacies all cut their deals with certain drug plans. So it's, it's, it's important to line up uh, a preferred pharmacy for the preferred or best pricing with your, pres with your prescriptions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a couple of minutes. A question some comes up, do you need to have a Part D? If you've got, particularly if you've got a uh, uh, Medigap plan, do you need to have one? Also, for the Medicare Advantage plans, there's about 50 of them out there, but there's four or five that don't offer dental, uh, don't offer the prescription drug coverage. So their prices are a little bit 
a little bit less. And incidentally, if you erred and got into one of those Medicare Advantage plans without prescription drug coverage, I would never recommend that for anyone. They're there, I don't know, I, the plans are rarely used. But if you're in that situation, you can't go out and pick up a standalone drug plan. I shouldn't say you can't, but I'll say you shouldn't. And the reason you shouldn't is that if you were to go out and subsequently pick up a standalone drug plan, maybe right within the enrollment period, the timing is right, but if you do that, they will disenroll you from the Medicare Advantage plan you're in. You'll be left with just a standalone drug plan. So there's some little tricks that we just have to keep in mind. The national base premium for 2019 for a standalone prescription <coughs> drug plan is 33.19. That's just like an average premium cost. Some plans are more, some are less. You must have some form of creditable drug coverage ongoing to avoid a penalty. And creditable coverage is coverage that is as good as Medicare drug coverage provides or your employee or retiree coverage, VA coverage, whatever. A penalty is added to your Part T premium if you don't enroll when you're first eligible and or if you didn't have creditable coverage. The penalty is rather severe because it's 1% of the national base premium for each month you don't have coverage. That is a lifetime penalty, that's the severe part of it, and the penalty applies even if you take no prescription drugs in the first place. So what I'm trying to say is you've got somebody that's particularly on the young side of Medicare, they're relatively healthy, they don't take prescription drugs, why do they need a plan? I say to that person, you need a plan unless you're going to tell me that five years from now and ten years from now and fifteen years from now you're not going to be taking out prescription drugs. If you can tell me that, then I'll say you're okay. Um, because what you need to do with these plans Go back to my referral to the Red Sox earlier on. You got to come in on the first inning of the ball game, and the first inning is when you turn 65. If you try to come into the ball game in the fifth or sixth or seventh inning, you're going to pay a penalty for coming in late. That's also uh, that's also true with uh, with uh, the Part B as well. If you're late on picking up the Part B premium, uh, there is a penalty of 10% a year on that. And that's, uh, that's potentially for a lifetime as well. So timely enrollment uh, in these, uh, in these uh, products uh, are important. Talking about a drug plan, and the cost components, well, it's really, this is the anatomy of a drug plan. It's also the anatomy of a Medicare Advantage plan, which is drugs plus your health coverage. The plan premium is one component. That's your monthly cost, how much you're paying the company premium-wise each month. There are deductibles under these plans. I'm going back to the Medicare Advantage plans now. Uh, the deductibles can be uh, can be uh, can be fairly can be fairly high, uh, a couple of hundred dollars or more for some of these items uh, on. The drug plan, the average deductible in 2019 for the standalone drug plan will be $415, I believe. It, well, it was $415 this year, uh, maybe a little bit higher next year. And uh, which means you would have to pay that you would have to kick in that amount before you could. Uh, have your, have your insurance for Tier 3, Tier 4, Tier 5 drugs kick in. You would have an, a, an annual deductible amount. There are co-pays and co-insurance, and that's what you pay. You go into the pharmacy, you've got a health plan, and you pay them 15 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, whatever, for a prescription. Now, I want to talk about how we compare plans, but I just there's one other aspect here that I want to pick up. We spent a lot of time on drugs because the, the drugs that you're taking, the prescriptions you're taking, are really the driver of the plan that you should be in. That's so important. Um, 
plans at the premium for Medicare Advantage plans, anywhere from zero to, let's say, 200 a month. So, in a sense, somebody could say, I'm pretty healthy, I'm taking a few drugs, but I'm pretty healthy, I'm going to latch onto the zero plan, not pay any, any, anything, because I don't think I'm going to have to go to the hospital for anything. Um, if you do that, you're in a situation where your drug costs can be a driver for what you're paying overall for your plan for that, for that year. You could pick up a low premium plan and end up paying considerably more from your medical expenses over the course of the year because of the drug formulary and the deductibles and so forth than you would be if you took a higher plan. With a, let's say a mid-sized Medicare Advantage plan is probably around 150 a month give or take for what you would what you would want. And the other thing I want to let you know, and some of you may know this already, with respect to drugs, prescription drugs, you should let me follow through what I was just saying. The, if you're healthy, put that plan into effect anyway. And you can get a low cost, low premium drug plan for fifteen, eighteen dollars a month. And you've got your credible coverage in place and the following year or five years later if you run into a problem, you can switch. That's what open enrollment's all about. You can switch to a, in a sense, a pricier plan, but it may not be a, a more suitable drug plan that's going to cover your, cover your circumstances that you may have five years from now. Open enrollment takes place every year and it's for, for that very reason. Um, as far as buying prescription drugs, in my example, somebody that's fairly healthy and they have a low-cost drug formulary in place, low-cost plan in place, you can go to, you, you've got drug outlets out here that are available. You don't need to be, they're not income sensitive to what your income is, they're not age sensitive. So somebody that's a millionaire at age 25 can walk into a place such as Walgreens, Walmart, Costco, BJ, they all have low-cost drug formularies. They don't advertise them. But I know at Walmart, for instance, and I just point that out only because I'm just more familiar with them, I'm not endorsing them, but if you walk into a Walmart and walk up to the counter and ask for their low-cost drug formulary, he'll produce five or six sheets of paper and give it to you. They are all tier one, low cost drugs. But I think they've got close to 400 drugs that they cover. And you can go in, bypass the plan, you pay your 15 bucks. I think the typical one at Walmart is probably about eight bucks a month for a 30 day supply, 15 to 18 bucks for a 90 day supply of many or most tier one drugs. So you can save yourself money and you know you've got a prescription drug plan in place should you need it. Now, most importantly, how to compare plans. Now, as you don't know, uh, well, I've got some handouts over here on the counter. They're spreadsheets for the Medicare Advantage plans, for the Medigap plans, and for the standalone drug plans. They give you the monthly premium. You're welcome to take a sheet, but you haven't done your job if you, if you just rely on those sheets. It can be very misleading. What you need to do if you're taking prescriptions is get on the computer or come see me, we'll get on the computer, Go to medicare.gov. Now this year, 2019, there was a second website which they are offering up. It's called mymedicare.gov. And it allows you to set up an account and it will give you online info support. It's a more high tech one than the, than the, than the, the original one that's been around for a few years. So they've upgraded each and every year. But if, you t if it's an extremely important step to get on to the system, if you're taking prescription drugs and you want to find the lowest cost drugs 
available for you so you can get the biggest bang for your bucks. And what you're doing when you go into Medicare.gov is you're going to have your prescription list in front of you. You can do a personalized search or a generalized search, but once you get in through the opening and you're into the system, you're going to be asked to list each drug by name, exactly how it's spelled, by dosage, the exact dosage that you've been prescribed, and the frequency with which you take it. And you go through a list, the list could be three or four drugs, it might be 18 or 20 drugs. You go through that list and put them in. And at the end, you're going to be able to get a listing of the 50 Medicare Advantage plans and or the seven or eight carriers that are doing, I'm sorry, the 26 carriers that are doing prescription drug plans. Well, standalone, you'd get them one way or the other. In low cost order, they go through a computer process that will give you the lowest cost plan, taking into account co-pays, deductibles, the whole bit. They're gonna tell you what your expected costs will be for the year based on the drugs that you're taking. And that should be your, really your guide into what plan you will pick up. The only uh, oh, two observations, if the, the plan that comes up number one is the lowest cost. You've got to look a little carefully at it. They're going to have plans one through five or six listed in the first <clears throat> couple of pages. And if number two and three are significantly lower, I'm sorry, significantly higher than number one, the lowest is listed first, you'll have to open up and go behind the scenes because it could be that number one is a lot lower than not covering one of the drugs, so it's not included in there. So if you've got six drugs you're putting in, it's not going to be immediately apparent that number one is only pricing five because they don't have the six until you go behind the scene and open up another box to do that. But it's an invaluable tool. The only people that don't need to bother with this are anybody that's not taking any prescriptions. And I suppose if you're taking one tier one that you could go to Walmart or Walgreens and pick up, that's probably the case too. But if you're taking a, a more expensive medicine, tier one is the cheapest. And they go all the way up. When you get up to tier three, the prescriptions start to get really pricey. When you get up to tier five, they're very pricey, unbelievably pricey. Uh, just to be dramatic, I had a client, dramatic emphasis, I guess, I had a client several years ago, and he was on a uh, leukemia drug, fairly new one. He had to be on it in order to keep him going. And without any medical coverage at all, his costs for that drug were $17,000 a month. And he was fortunate enough to get some coverage and cover most of it and then eventually get a scholarship, GoFundMe type thing from a drug manufacturer, so he was, was finally set. But drugs can be extremely expensive, particularly the three, three through five, and they change year to year. The formularies are tweaked every year. So uh, the other problem could be if your number one is cheaper, maybe it isn't cheaper by all that much, and maybe your number one is not the plan you're on now. And maybe your number one just happens to be a plan that's not covered by your primary. And then you might have to drop down to number two. But having said that, I found over the years in this area of Massachusetts, uh, most people end up, not all, but most people end up on a Tufts plan or Blue Cross Blue Shield just because the doctors and the networks and the hospital around there have them all. Um, I guess I, I would make one more point on the Medigap plans. This is the plan that will cover everything. If you have my earlier example of somebody that had incurred a hospital bill of a couple of hundred thousand bucks, and they, one of the one of the people had a uh, supplement one plan. They did not have to pay anything out of the pocket. Anything, everything had been covered. The plan premium paid for everything. The premiums are a little bit more pricey than than uh, 
than the uh, premium for the Medi Medi Medicare Advantage plans. So it just all depends what your income situation, financial situation is. Um, I've had people tell me they just can't afford what some of the things that are out there, and I've had other people that I've talked to say, I'm fortunate, I can afford stuff, I want peace of mind at night, I'm just going to take the supplement one and get a standalone plan and be all set. And any decision that you make this fall is only for next year. That's not a lifetime decision. You get the opportunity to review everything again next year. And I would say that anybody who's taking a multiple number of drugs should review their situation every single year. The uh, Chine counselors can never recommend a plan. We're not endorsed by anybody. We're not supporting anybody. We can guide you to, towards what is the most appropriate plan for you under the circumstances, but it's your final decision. And again, there are about 50 or so Medicare Advantage plans and all these iterations that you have to look at and you run the drug finder and see where you're at. For the medic, and you run the drug finder if you're on a standalone prescription drug pl uh, plan situation. That's the same situation as far as the drugs go. The medic gap plan, the supplement one and the supplement two, the ones that Medicare is your is your network. Uh, it's unique in the state. We have one core plan and one supplement one plan. That's it. We have seven or eight insurers that issue them. The Massachusetts Insurance Department has told these insurers, if you issue the plans that we are saying you, we're allowing you, then we will allow you to charge anything you want for monthly premium. So folks, the monthly premium is very, pretty widely between the plans for the same product. So I am not offering you a, a plan recommendation. There is only one plan, one core and one supplement. But what I'm saying is the lowest cost provider of those plans right now is Blue Cross Blue Shield. So uh, you might want to keep that in mind, and that's on the information that's over there. Yeah, the, uh, I think it, there's a sheet on Part D coverages between 2018 and 2019, the uh, deductible under uh, for the Part D coverage under the under the, the benchmark deductible for Part D coverage is four hundred and five dollars. Next year it goes to four hundred and fifteen dollars. This is that old donut hole situation, which is shrinking, 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 and by two thousand twenty will be gone. Uh, it's got the once you reach the donut hole, you pay twenty five percent. Your plan pays seventy five percent, and then you're kind of stuck at that point for. Uh, a short stretch. The donut hole now is just the hole between. It's shrinking. This year was thirty-seven, three thousand seven fifty to five thousand. Next year is three thousand eight twenty to five thousand one hundred. It's gradually shrinking up. Once you get past that out-of-pocket threshold, if you're in an unfortunate position to be up there, you get a catastrophic cost share, and we're virtually all of your drugs are paid for by by the plan. You've got uh, the greater of 5% of the $3.40 for a, a prescription. So I think the questions to ask yourself when you're making a decision, I think I've hinted on most of these, will my plan cover all the drugs I take? And I would add an addendum to that, and at what price will the drugs be for that coverage? How much will my plan cost? Does my plan have a deductible? And which Medicare Advantage plans does my doctor take? There's another category in there too, which isn't on the sheet, but there's a maximum out-of-pocket cost for these plans. And I think the benchmark for Medicare Advantage is, I think it's about $33,500, but there are variants. There are a few plans that are less to max out-of-pockets, and there are some that are 5,000, 6,000, and there's one or two of these plans that are $10,000 out of pocket. Uh, not out of pocket, max deductible over the course of the year. So once you have 
Notwithstanding what your plan provisions are, once you pay $3,500, for instance, out of your pocket, then the rest is, of anything else is going to be covered by the plan. If it's $5,000, it's $5,000. If it's $6,000, it's $6,000. $10,000, it's $10,000. Your options for changing plans during open enrollment. If you're in a Medicare Advantage plan right now, you can change to a different Medicare Advantage plan. And incidentally, that process can be repeated between January and March of next year. You can change back to original Medicare, meaning you get out of a Medicare Advantage plan and then enroll. If you do it during the open enrollment period, you can enroll in Part D. They're open enrollment sensitive. So you can enroll in a Part D standalone plan. And then if you wish, pick up a Medigap plan. The choice is yours. If you have just original Med Medicare, Parts A and B, you can drop or switch Part D plans during open enrollment. You can enroll in a, in, a, in a Medicare Advantage plan with drug coverage in open enrollment. Obviously, that's one or the other. You don't <coughs> switch. <laughs> You're going to be at the end of open enrollment. You want to be in a Part D drug plan or in a Medicare Advantage plan with drug coverage. One or the other, not both. There are assistance programs, state and federal, to help people, these are all, by and large, income sensitive for qualifying, <coughs> sometimes asset sensitive as well. Extra help is a low income su subsidy provided through the Social Security Administration for those that are eligible and that helps to, it's a financial wrap around some of the costs of prescription drugs. It just focuses on prescription drugs. The state has two programs. One is Prescription Advantage. That too is to help people with prescription advantage, uh, with their prescription costs. The surprising thing is there's several levels of Prescription Advantage and a single person who is earning as much as approximately $50,000 a year can still get some help from Prescription Advantage. Prescription advantage is income sensitive and not asset sensitive. And then the final program, it's a whole series of programs through Mass Health. And that's the Medicaid program for Massachusetts. These programs are based on income and assets. There's all kinds of programs out there, and that's something that you want to see a Shine Council to talk about. And in fact, when you come in to do, if, if and when you come in to, uh, for an appointment for open enrollment, the first thing I do is a quick income screening to see where you are vis-a-vis -vis these other programs to see if there would be of any help to you. That's just part of the process as we do the income, income screening. So, where do you go for help? Well, first place you might, it's local, it's right here. We can try to help you here this fall. One-on-one -on -one appointment. Uh, there are phone numbers here for Medicare, the eight, National 800 number. And incidentally, what happens, and that's what happened the last two years, the appointments get filled up. Mystic Valley in Walden has appointments, and they, get, and they do it all week long for, you know, it's a full-time job down there for several people. But Somewhere along the line, each of the last two years, the signal has gone out. We are now booked for the rest of the time, up until December 7th. So if people call MBES on uh, December 1, for instance, they may get a message, call 1-800-MEDICARE. We just can't handle it anymore. But that, that happens as time goes on. There are pharmacy outreach programs in the state to help you further review drug coverages. There are state-sponsored pharmacy assistance programs. I have information about these should, as part of the income screening, if anybody, uh, you know, if it looks like a direction that we need to go. Uh, Medicare Advocacy uh, Project, MAP, assists beneficiaries in obtaining Medicare-related health insurance coverage to which they entitled. They get into some legal issues and uh, things that, uh, there are certain decisions that are made by health insurers or even Medicare that can be appealed. 
you know, there's an appeal process for doing that, and sometimes the appeals uh, will win. Not always, but uh, they do pretty well with the appeals, by and large. So that, I guess, I think, is my quick and dirty on uh, Medicare open enrollment. There are several handouts over here. I just want to hold up one other item that I have. This is the Medicare and You book. It's put out by the federal government. It's a good book. It really uh, goes into a great deal about all aspects of Medicare. And it even has uh, Medicare Health Plan spreadsheets at the back because these things are sent out by zip code. So the first 12 chapters of this book are standard that everybody gets. The back section with the plan spreadsheets are from Massachusetts residents in zip code 01864. And that's how they do it. That's the good news. The not so good news on relying on these sheets is that these books are printed the end of August, early September. They don't have all the information. We have all the information on these spreadsheets. They are updated versions of what this is. But the book is excellent. And when you're on Medicare, you'll get one in the mail each fall. Uh, it should arrive sometime in September, I think. Late September, 1st of October. And should you not have one and need one, they always have several copies at the library over here. Any library would have them, so if you need to refer to them or something. But with that, I think I'll stop and try to answer any questions that anyone may have. And if you need to see me uh, with a personal situation, I might be able to do something quickly. But obviously, we, we're not doing full skill appointments for that. Yes? If you're not collecting Social Security, you're not. Where do you go to sign up for Medicare? What? Uh, you sign up for Medicare, there's two. You can sign up online or you can go to the Social Security office. Even if you're not currently collecting? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. Social Security office handles either or both of those items. Sometimes when I'm talking to people and they realize they're coming up on 65 and I say, well, and you're, are we going to do Social Security? They say, well, probably, I'm thinking about it, start it now or wait a little bit. No. They said, you know, two for one, go to the Social Security office, sit down with somebody, Talk about Social Security, they will help you fill out the forms for Social Security, they'll help you fill out the forms for Medicare. But you don't have to do them both together, you can just go in and see somebody on, you get on, get on Medicare. Because you may want to, your strategy might be, Medicare A, you should have at age 65 anyway. And if you're not working, you should have Medicare B in place. Social Security, that's different. Uh, it's, you get to 100% of your Social Security potential at approximately 66 years and 10 months. That's a sliding scale. And if you wait until age 70, you max out your Social Security and get a roughly 133% of your benefit. But that all depends on your income needs and so forth. I like to give the, it's a fictitious, but I like to give the example for emphasis about the guy that says, I'm going to win the jackpot. I'm going to wait to age 90. I'm going to start collecting my Social Security and get 500%. doesn't work that way. The guy goes in, signs up, gets one check and drops dead. Who's won? I think the government has won. Yeah. So you get to balance everything off. With, uh, does that answer your... Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir. Okay. Anybody else with a question at all at this point? The other, the other question is, I'd probably answer it myself, but if you're still working and you have an employee paying for your health benefits and you're 65, you don't need to accept Medicare Part B or any of those. That's absolutely and correct. And it continues until you either stop working, even if it's age 70, and you're not penalized that 10%. That is true. And you get a lot of misinformation, and I will tell you that one of the reasons I started with the SHINE program in 2006, my life's over here, 2006, I think, is uh, she had some difficulties and issues about working in Part B, and uh, my mother was having difficulties with the health plan, and I had some questions, and she finally said, why don't you go take a course and 
pick, and become a Shine Council, you can maybe answer our questions and answer <laughs> questions for you folks as yeah. well. So, <laughs> as somebody said, I've been trying to get it right ever since, so here I'm <laughs> still am 12 years later. But the other thing is, um, the other half of that coin, though, is that, and this is what a lot of people are not aware of, and I don't know the numbers, but some of the employer health plans are presuming, they may tell you, they may not, they're presuming that you're picking up Part A because that's part of the funding for their benefits should you be actively employed over 65 and have a hospital stay. It may well be that that plan is expecting Part A to kick in for yeah. 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 Uh, primary or secondary at least yeah. and people need to be aware of that and what I find uh, find is that uh, HR people are not necessarily aware of that. Um, one other very quick story to emphasize that the, the, the medical health care field pre-65 is completely different from the post-65. It's two different worlds, it's two different animals and uh, uh, I guess my brother wouldn't mind my telling you. He was a expert, he worked for Liberty Mutual health insurance. He testified before some of Kennedy's subcommittees a number of years ago. And when he retired, I asked him what he was doing for his health insurance. And uh, he told me he picked up a Medigap plan. I said, oh, that's good. Full coverage on the yard. And he said, I said, who'd you go with? And he said, United Healthcare. I said, did you know you're paying $35 a month, $40 a month more for the same product you could have got from Blue Cross? I had no idea, and I don't. I have no business. I have no idea about the business he was in. It's two completely different worlds, and sometimes HR people, it's tough for them to bridge that gap between them. And we were getting some actually misleading advice at one point. So um, when saying, you say uh, Blue Cross, you're saying that is a supplemental to back up the other twenty percent. That supplemental plan is one of the Medigap plans. If you get the sub one. That backs up the, the gap in full. You would not have to pay a penny out of your pocket other than uh, your monthly premium. Mm -hmm. The monthly premium for that is about 195, 196, 197 a month. And you'd have to add the, uh, uh, there, again, the sheets mm -hmm. over here. I didn't want to push these sheets in front of you because I don't want people going out thinking I've got the sheets and I'm just going to look and you're not doing yourself the best service by doing that. They're helpful to have, but not the. Uh oh, now I get a tough question coming. Yes. No, you don't. I don't think you're explaining the fact that Massachusetts tells the insurance companies what they have to offer. Oh yeah. And they can do any price. Yeah. So you need whatever, whether you're going gap or region even HMO, you need to check your premium because you're going to get the same service and go pay a lower premium instead of... Well, it may not be the same benefits, but you're, you're, the other good point is that every plan, every plan that's issued in Massachusetts is issued through the Massachusetts Insurance Department. They all have to get their approvals. And that's the that's the, the madhouse in the, the summer in there is the Provide, plan providers are rushing their changes into the Mass Insurance Department to get them approved and ready to open a roll with them. Uh, the, whether it's just tweaking the drug formularies or, or adding a, you know, a minor benefit or whatever. And uh, uh, it's, a good, it's a good point. Uh, your, your, but your hospital benefits can, can differ slightly between plan, plan to plan. And uh, you've certainly got the deductibles and co-insurances and all that to take into effect. Um, well, again, I guess and, uh, if there are any other questions at all on this, and uh, if not, we'll, we'll be here for further questions one-on-one uh, -on -one for a little bit right now, and uh, we can schedule appointments as well to go through, uh, go through what, uh, what you need. All right, I, I thank you very much, and I hope that I've been at least of some help to you going forward here. Thank you. Thank you.